Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors meeting for Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. I will call this meeting to order and I will ask staff if they uh, can change our virtual screen to show the US flag and we will do our Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, please stand as you are able and uh, uh, recite the pledge. I will start it. I pledge allegiance Please. to the flag, the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, the Republic which it stands, which it stands one, one nation, nation under, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice. And justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Now we'll go back to our agenda. And the next item up is the roll call. Before we do that, I think. Uh, Melinda, I should introduce uh, some of the new people because we'll hear some different names during the roll call. It was quite a turnover with the new year. Uh, so let me welcome uh, new members. Uh, first, we have Kyle Brown of Louisville, who was previously an alternate and is now the director from the city of Louisville. Uh, Kat Bristow from the town of Loch Bui. Tim Dietz, town of Castle Rock. Marnie Mornis, Gilpin County. Catherine Whitman, City of Decono, who previously also uh, was an alternate. Welcome. Tom Mahawold, Town of Nederland. Todd Williams from the City of Central. We also have uh, several new alternates as a result of this uh, changeover. From the City of Louisville, we have Deborah Fahey, from, uh, who's now the alternate to Kyle Brown. And from the Town of Loch Bowie, Jacqueline White who is now the alternate to the director, Kat Bristow. From Jefferson County, the new alternate is Commissioner Leslie Dahlkemper. And from the town of Bennett, Royce Pindell. Uh, I hope that I did not miss anybody who is new. That's the list I was provided. I hope to meet you all in person next month. Uh, additionally, uh, for the new uh, members, if your director is present and you are the alternate, uh, we can have only one representative from each jurisdiction participating during the board meeting. So we welcome alternates to uh, observe and and uh, listen uh, and probably text their their director back back you know back channel. Uh, but I remember in one of my first meetings as an alternate, I had made the mortal I committed the mortal sin of sitting at the at the table and was immediately dressed down and told to sit in the audience. So that's how I learned. Thank you, Doug. Uh, for uh, teaching me that lesson. Thank you. Uh, Melinda, can we go ahead with the roll call now? Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And for our new members, um, <clears throat> I'll just have a reminder. Obviously, we have staff working on the back end trying to get everyone promoted um, so you can participate in this meeting. If you are not able to respond during roll call, uh, I will ask at the end for people to raise their virtual hand if they were not able to respond. <clears throat> so with that, I will go ahead and begin our roll call. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca, Adams County. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Present. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Here. Austin Ward, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. Here. Nicholas Williams of Denver County. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layton, Douglas Here. County. Oh, there we go. Thank you, George. Uh, Sorry, Marie I've done mute. <laughs> no problem. Marie Mornis of Gilpin County. Here. Tracy Kraft Tharp of Jefferson County. Yes. Lisa Smith of Arvada. Here. Allison Coombs, Aurora. Mike Kaufman, Aurora. Larry Vidham, Bennett. Here. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spiel, Spear, Boulder. Here. Margot Ramsden, Bomar. Jan Plowski, Brighton. Adam Cushing, Brighton. Oh, here, I'm. it's Jan, I'm here. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Jan. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Here. Tammy Mauer, Centennial. Present. Thank you. Todd Williams, Central City. Here. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Here. Catherine Whitman, Decono. 
Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Here, good evening. Thank you. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Here. Ari Harrison, Erie. Sarah Laughlin, Erie. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Here. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Present. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Here. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Jeslyn Sherezai, Lakewood. Here. Here. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Here. Kat Bristow, Lockbuoy. Present. Wynn Shaw, Lone Tree. Present. Joan Peck, Longmont. Here. Kyle Brown, Louisville. Deborah Fahey, Louisville. Here. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Hello. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Present. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahallon, Nederland. Here. Meredith Lighty, Northland. John Dyack, Parker. Here. Sally Daigle, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. I'm here, Sally. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Sally. Right. <clears throat> uh, Neil Shaw, did you respond to Superior? <laughs> oh, you might you might want to check your audio. You seem a little muffled. Um, Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. I'm here. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Here. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Glad to be here. Thank you. Sally Chafee of CDOT. Here. Rebecca White of CDOT. Here. Brian Welch of RTD. All right. And um, if I could just see. I'm uh, here. Oh, thank you so Sorry. much, Brian. Thank you for being here. Um, and then uh, I'll ask anyone to raise their virtual hand that wasn't able to respond. Uh, looks like we have Allison Coombs uh, of Aurora, Richard Kondo of Northland, and Todd Williams of Central City. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we also have Kyle Brown and uh, Margot Ramsden participating as well. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I will hand it back to you and we do have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Melinda. I see we have 90 people present on the meeting, uh, most of whom are board members. So thank you for being here. I should also mention that we have another new alternate uh, that I didn't point out, and that is uh, an alternate for Boulder County, who uh, is our immediate past chair, uh, Ashley Stolzman, who is now a member of the Board of Commissioners in Boulder County and is the alternate to uh, Commissioner Levy. So uh, I don't have the attendee list right in front of me, so I don't know if Ashley is here, uh, but, uh, uh, but thank you for your service to Dr. Cog. Uh, the first order of business is, uh, I have the wrong thing on my screen. There we go. Uh, the first order of business is to uh, solicit a motion to approve our agenda for the evening. And uh, so uh, I see uh, Mayor Harmon, uh, you, you uh, want to make the motion? Yes, I'd like to move that we approve the agenda for January 18th, 2023. Thank you. Uh, Director Teal. I will be happy to second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please uh, unmute and say aye. 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 Wait, waiting for any stragglers? Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, any opposed? Uh, signify by saying no and then leave the meeting, I guess. Uh -huh. Hearing none, uh, no abstentions, uh, the uh, agenda is approved. Next item of business is a report of the chair. I just have one item I want to uh, highlight for members, especially the new members. And that is that during the, uh, the, the previous year, sometime over the summer, actually starting with our board retreat, but really kicking off toward the end of summer, uh, the board uh, has asked the staff to formulate 
uh, a process for a regional conversation on housing and uh, especially to uh, come up with a regional housing strategy uh, with the intent of uh, measuring, evaluating, uh, assessing our investments in terms of how well they serve uh, the, the cost of housing in, in the metropolitan area. Uh, I think any poll will show you that housing affordability has emerged as the top concern, at least in most polls, but it always in the top three uh, is affordable housing in the metro area. And so the board work session in February will be devoted to, in large part, to presentation on uh, this issue of the regional housing strategy. It's got uh, added importance given the governor's uh, remarks uh, this week and uh, the possibility that the certainty actually, and we'll hear about that later in the meeting, that uh, the legislature will take up issues about affordable housing statewide and uh, the implications on, on us as local officials. So please be sure to, uh, you can attend that meeting and alternates are certainly welcome at the uh, work session. With that, uh, let me move on and ask for a report from the Performance and Engagement Committee. Director Shaw. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Performance Engagement and Engagement Committee met this evening. We had an, in, uh, an informational briefing uh, on the board retreat for this year and the annual award celebration update. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next item is report from the Finance and Budget Committee. And with that, uh, we have Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Finance and Budget Committee met tonight and we had six action items uh, that were all approved unanimously in the interest of brevity. I will say that five were resolutions authorizing Executive Director Rex to negotiate and execute contracts for specified services and specified amounts. And one was a resolution authorizing Executive Director Rex to accept state funds of $100,000 from OED uh, to contract for IIJA grants navigation services. And I'd be happy to provide more detail on any of those if needed, but that's my report. Thank you, Director Baker. And as always for both committees, you know that uh, on the uh, Dr. Cod website, you can download the meeting packet for both committees um, and uh, see all of the background material on those items. The next uh, agenda item mm -hmm. is report of the executive director. Uh, do we have executive director Rex? He's disappeared from my screen. I'm here, sir. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Great, cool. Thank so you, sir, very much. Uh, Hey, good evening, everyone. It's great to see everybody again, and thank you for your continued uh, flexibility regarding meeting location. Um, oh, please. I will admit that it's kind of great having having uh, some of these options, right, that we didn't have uh, a yes. few years ago, so it's, it's tremendous. I think we would have probably had to cancel this meeting uh, a couple, three years ago, so it's wonderful to see all your faces on the screen, at least. Um, just a few things for me, Mr. Chairman. First, um, just to just to expand a little bit on the housing conversation that you mentioned, we are indeed going to continue that conversation at the February board work session on February 1st. And staff has been busy since the last time we've had this, they had the conversation in December, um, reaching out, researching best practices throughout uh, the country, um, meeting with uh, various regional partners to understand what is currently underway and opportunities for collaboration, um, identifying, um, information and possible discussion topics for the board, not only in February, but for the coming months uh, going forward. Um, and so yeah, so we're really anticipating coming back at the board uh, work session in February. Um, you know, we're also hopeful that there could be some additional information, dare I say, uh, drafts on proposed bills associated in the housing space. And if that's the case, hopefully the timing is right that we'll be able to take those up at the board work session and actually uh, go through those as, as a group. So just kind of FYI on that. Um, the second item I wanted to just mention to you all is uh, each year, Dr. Cog solicits its directors to serve on a number of committee assignments, both internal to the agency and external boards in which Dr. Cog has a seat at the table. Um, and so an email will be going out tomorrow soliciting for the following. Uh, first. 
Uh, and foremost, the, uh, there will be a solicitation for two of your internal committees. So it's the Finance and Budget Committee and the Performance and Engagement Committee. Um, so I would, I would hope that the, the board directors will strongly consider applying for those. Um, ultimately, the nominee committee will make a recommendation um, on, on uh, who will serve on those committees and bring that back to the board in February. So, um, so please carefully consider that. Those two committees were established to provide board members an opportunity uh, uh, to be more involved in the decision-making process of Dr. Cog and I, there, those are two really, really great committees. Anybody serves on them. And I think that you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll gain um, a, a pretty good understanding of what we do here at Dr. Cog through, those, through both of those committees. The other uh, solicitation that will be part of the same email is for, um, four other regional committees that we have a seat, or quite frankly, one of them we, is actually uh, one that we run here at Dr. Cog. And those are the, 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 the STAC or the State Transportation Advisory Committee, the Regional Transportation Committee. Um, uh, what else? The E-470, we have a seat at the table on the E-470 Board of Directors and the Advisory Committee on Aging, which uh, is, uh, is a committee that Dr. Cog runs as part of our work at the, of the Area Agency on Aging. So those will be going out tomorrow. Uh, again, please consider uh, your participation on those. And those, all those selections will be made at the uh, February board meeting. The last thing I wanna mention is, uh, gee whiz, Winter Bike to Work Day is on February 10th this year. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to celebrate biking in the region and, and uh, to highlight the fact that most, day, most days you can bike year round. I'm not quite sure about today, but hopefully it's cleared up a little bit by February 10th. And um, if you're interested in this event, please uh, visit biketoworkday.co and it has a bunch of information out there with regards to you know, uh, how you can, you can help support the event, uh, map out your routes where, um, uh, where there are breakfast stations associated with, Dr. Cog will have a breakfast station um, across from the city, city county building in, uh, in uh, Civic Center Park. Uh, so if you're in the neighborhood, just kind of drop by and say hi, we'd love to see you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report for this evening. Thank you so much. Yes, and uh, uh, let me add my thanks to the staff for uh, the decision to go virtual tonight. Although the storm didn't turn out to be quite as uh, significant accumulation as we expected, uh, it's it's nice that we were flexible enough and and we have this uh, uh, forum to uh, have all our members. We probably wouldn't have had this many people here uh, had we not gone virtual. So uh, the next item is public comment, and we set aside about forty five minutes uh, for public comment. And each speaker has three minutes. And uh, if there's uh, people who want to speak after forty five minutes, we'll stay at the end of the meeting and carry it over. I uh, see that we have one uh, person raising their hand, uh, Melinda, and uh, can you uh, promote him over? And I see it's my friend, Randall Loeb. Randall, welcome. Good, e Good evening. Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, ha hallelujah. Uh, I hope everybody's warm tonight. As I look out the window, I uh, am uh, amazed that people are out there, even though it's not as bad as it might have been. For some people, of course, it is all the time. I'm happy that you're working on the housing. Um, this hotel that I've been in since the epidemic, um, this uh, protective action program of FEMA has been um, slotted to close as of April. And I was talking to some staff who are here under the uh, aegis of the Salvation Army. And all of them um, expressed the same thing that most of us have felt of the 140 um, residents that um, they were surprised, shocked, and felt as if they had not been engaged or involved in the process by the establishment. When you're discussing housing and anything regarding it, and I've been on several of the Metro Vision um, uh, development groups, including transit, um, it's important that we be uh, transparent and accountable 
and also colleagues in terms of parity and equity to include those people who are friends, uh, disenfranchised and marginalized to uh, be a part of the decision making. And so I hope when you're looking at this affordable, which I would like to say should be also low income, that you're more or not considering this as a partnership in the same way when we do a, um, a scenario um, a, where we uh, plan a, 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 a development, which has been part of Housing Colorado for some time doing their vignettes um, and include people who would be living in these places and people who are affected by them as equal partners in the decision-making and also the policy-making. As an elder, um, I just had my um, left cataract um, operation today at Denver Health, by the way. It seems to me that we often think that we know what's going on when we're um, not as aware because we haven't been involved in it as much of the difficulties that people face in the struggle to take care of themselves. And we need to be able to look at each other with the feeling that we're brothers and sisters and not just that we live in the same locale. And so I'm praying that we can understand what I'm talking about because my mode of transportation is mostly a bicycle and I certainly wouldn't be trying to ride it under the circumstances right this second. And many times I see people on the transit system that need real serious mental involvement and mental health involvement. And I would urge us to find new ways to balance the differences between policymakers and city planners and urban planners and development in the areas around the metro region with the people who are essentially struggling to take care of themselves. And with that, I have Thank to you, say Randall. good night. Thank you, Randall. I think it's an excellent suggestion that I'll discuss with staff about uh, ensuring that we incorporate uh, people with lived experience, uh, not just with homelessness, uh, but with affordability uh, in general. So thank you for that. And uh, I'm glad to hear your cataract uh, surgery was successful. I'm surprised uh, after you told us last night you were gonna have that, that uh, you're able to actually be here. So thank you very much, Randall. Uh, Melinda, I don't see any other hands raised, but let me ask if there anyone else in the attendees who wants to offer public comment? I see none. So uh, uh, let's move on then to our next item, which is a motion to approve our consent agenda. In the packet, uh, you might have seen uh, or I hope you've seen the three items that are on the consent agenda. And uh, I will ask if there is a member who would like to make a motion to that effect. And I see Director Levy, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very happy to move approval of the consent agenda. Thank you. Uh, Director Baker? And I will second. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded uh, to approve the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Uh, please, everyone, unmute and say aye if you're voting aye. 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 If there are any, oop, okay, sorry. Any more? No. All right. Uh, any opposed, please say no. I hear none opposed. Any uh, abstentions? Hearing no abstentions, the consent agenda is approved unanimously, which is exactly how we like it. So our first action item for the evening, uh, item nine, discussion of the fiscal year 22, first year TIP project delays. And we have uh, Todd Cottrell up. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, and, and good evening, everyone. So uh, before you in the attachment is staff's report for the federal fiscal year 2022 first year TIP project delays. Um, a couple things I'd like to start off with if possible. Um, the first uh, is actually a change to the report in this attachment. Um, it doesn't look like the most recent version happened to get into this uh, agenda packet, uh, but the change, a couple of changes I would like to point out is um, if you see any references to December 2022, 
Um, those should automatically be assumed to be January of 2023. Um, again, we didn't encounter any other issues. We just happened to move that date forward as we were moving through the progression of the committees. Um, secondly, we did request that a sponsor representative from each of the delayed projects uh, to be on this call to answer any questions, if you have any, as we progress through this presentation. Um, so concerning these delays, the adapted TIP policy outlines the expectations for the initiation of project phases and each year that a project has assigned Dr. Cog funding, um, including how to address these delays if they do take place. Uh, to begin this process for, again, federal fiscal year 22, uh, in early October, staff requested uh, that CDOT and RTD to review the status of those projects that had the FY22 funding. So for those projects that did not initiate their assigned project phase by October and, there, and were therefore delayed, uh, staff contacted those sponsors to find out the reasons for their delay, discover the current status of the project, and then also to assist them in developing an action plan to initiate the project phases that were delayed. So the attached report that you see does summarize those findings. Um, overall, there was 22 projects that were first year delayed. Uh, three of those have already been initiated and therefore are no longer delayed. Um, and in fact, one project sponsor has actually canceled their project and end up returning those funds back to Dr. Cog for reprogramming. So approving staff's rec recommendation this evening would allow those remaining 18 delayed projects to continue. Um, there's a few observations that we'd like to point out. So the number of delayed pro projects for this year, uh, well, for federal fiscal year 22 um, is back to being relatively average, um, at least compared to um, historical averages. Um, over the last few years, there has been a higher number of delays, mostly associated with uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19 and all the delays that have happened with that. Um, when we look at the details as to why these projects were delayed, um, there seems to be fairly equal distribution um, between both right-of-way and design issues. Um, another main reason stems from what staff feels is really a lack of pre-planning activities when these projects were first developed. Some of these go back uh, three, four, five years. Uh, so staff is working through this aspect of this delay in a couple different ways. Uh, first of all, we've added a section into the, the current TIP applications. Um, as you know, hopefully we are currently near the end of call four, but within those applications, we have um, added a section that hopefully will force the applicants to really think about more about these projects um, when before they actually apply. Secondly, um, we have started a new program here at Dr. Cog to proactively reach out to all active TIP project sponsors uh, to get a monthly update on their individual TIP funded projects. Uh, and that is even for those projects that are not, not delayed. Hopefully that will pay pay dividends in the future. Um, we can learn about any problems that may arise before they actually become problems and therefore delays. Um, so with that, that concludes the information I have for you. I'm happy to take any comments or questions. I would, like, uh, would tell you that both TAC and RTC did recommend approval. Um, if not, the motion before you is to approve the actions proposed by Dr. Cog staff regarding TIP project delays for fiscal year 2022. Thank you, Todd. I'm glad you spoke at the end there about the proactive approach that we're taking. Uh, but I did have a question on that. Uh, unless someone else wants to go first, uh, let me ask that. Uh, what kind of resources will that take uh, on staff uh, versus how many uh, projects are currently on the tip that you'd have to check in with every month? And what, what's the format for checking in? Is it uh, a submission from the sponsor? Is it uh, is it us reaching out to just uh, delve a little more deeply into that process? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, we actually added a, a new Dr. Cog planner to help assist us, us in this. Um, so approximately half of his job responsibilities will be to work out um, and contact approximately 100 um, projects and find out the status of those. Uh, we are looking and working through having conversations uh, for the rest of this month into early next month, um, at least having initial contact with those sponsors. From that initial conversation, we're hoping to have monthly 
whether emails or uh, a, a quick video call, something to that effect. Um, mm -hmm. It can be easy as maybe sending a spreadsheet back and forth or just a quick email. Um, we're trying not to be intrusive in this process. Uh, we all know going through the federal aid process is a headache enough. We certainly do not want to add another layer of government um, into the already confusing process. But we hope that this eventually will pay dividends by proactively looking at the entire process. Thank you. And who will review that? Will that be reviewed? Uh, uh, will the board be given presentation on this periodically, or, or what? What will be the uh, uh, the dissemination of these reports at Dr. Cog? Right, and that's a good question. And I don't think I have an answer for you yet because okay. we are a little unsure at this point, and we're waiting for a couple more months worth of data to really determine the path on how we would provide updates. Um, it, it is certainly possible, as you mentioned, that maybe on a quarterly or every six month basis, we may publish something or maybe even something monthly on a, a monthly update on our website. Um, so the only thing I could really say at this point is give us a couple more months to collect data and stay tuned. We will certainly come back at a later time. Okay, and then the, the planner who's gonna be doing this on a half time basis, uh, if there are uh, problems and potential delays that are cropping up on a certain number of projects. What is the role of Dr. Cog in expediting or mitigating or or negotiating any sort of uh, uh, resolution of those delays? Do we play a role in that or do we just uh, gather the information? Um, I think the first role is really to gather the information and to help identify where there are roadblocks. Um, what we have historically seen, those road, roadblocks are as simple as miscommunication. Right. So hopefully Dr. Cog can sort of insert ourselves into that process, maybe solve a problem within a few days where uh, maybe CDOT and the sponsors keep going back and forth and missing each other. Um, it's all gonna really depend on what that problem is, sure. but the anticipation um, as a result of this process is to insert our our, uh, our staff time into that process and hopefully solve some of those problems that may arise. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, questions, other directors, comments? I see uh, no hands going up. So thank you very much, uh, Todd. Appreciate the presentation. And uh, let me ask, if I can get to my agenda, is there a director who would like to make a motion on this issue? Director Baker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move to approve the actions proposed by Dr. Cog's staff regarding fiscal year 2022 first year TIP project delays. And I ask for a second. Thank you. And I see Director Shaw's hand up first. Thank you. I second this motion. Thank you. And uh, any discussion on this? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor, please unmute again and say aye. 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 Thank you. Are there aye. any directors aye. who would, and we got a, we got a, a canine vote also there. Thank you. Uh, can we uh, uh, unmute if anyone wants to vote no on this? Please say no. Hearing none, are there any abstentions? Hearing none, that also passes unanimously. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. <laughs> presentation. Our next action item is uh, number 10, discussion of the draft legislative principle statement and the draft 2023 policy statement on state legislative issue. And Rich Morrow, our Director of Legislative Affairs, is up. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and directors. Good evening. Um, this item uh, concerns uh, approval of the state legislative policy statement uh, first draft of the uh, item was presented to you uh, in your November board packet, and we present the, the board draft uh, tonight. Uh, it does have um, a handful of uh, suggested changes to that uh, document uh, presented uh, from board members, and um, they are highlighted for your ease of reading in the ye in yellow in the document, and hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at it. Um, 
I would just uh, say basically that um, this the the main changes, for instance, we have a principal statement and then the policy statement. So the principal statement just kind of outlines the basis for which uh, Dr. Cog generally takes positions on issues. Um, and we, we just uh, updated a couple of things on that, including uh, including uh, CCAT in reference uh, to what we already had for CML and CCI and making it clear that the main issues that we take positions on are those that directly affect Dr. Cog uh, or any one of its programs. We can also take positions and have in the past, depending on board direction, uh, if it's a proposal that has uh, special significance to the region uh, or um, a unique effect on, on local governments in the region. So we just clarified that. And then on the policy statement, um, we, we included uh, a general statement in the introduction on equity and diversity issues. And um, later on in the, in the transportation section, uh, clarified specific support for increasing funding for transit in the region and um, updated or strengthened some language in uh, the transportation for older adults section. We also strengthened the language in the aging section on uh, for the long-term care ombudsman. And, um, and then in the environment section, we added some references to climate in the uh, uh, air quality area. And um, with, with that, I think I, I won't go into any more detail. I'll just stop and see if there's any comments or questions from the board. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, Director Levy. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I think I would know after three years of using this. Uh, uh, Director Levy, you are the first up. Go ahead. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Chair and, um, and, and, and Rich, uh, thank you so much for incorporating a lot of the comments that I sent. Um, I sent Rich a, a PDF with all my little sticky notes on it, and he did a very nice job of addressing most of them. Um, the, 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 the one thing I wanted to bring up that I, I really think should be strengthened, and I realize that we don't have a lot of time set aside for this tonight, um, and it's something that probably deserves some time for staff to work on a little bit, is the equity statement. And I appreciate the, the language in the intro on that, but I think in our, um, in our transportation section more specifically, I think we could really um, strengthen that language and acknowledge mm -hmm. that um, there are many communities that have been underserved with transportation um, services and connections for many years. Um, there are also disproportionate impacts of um, on air quality because of, of the way transportation improvements have been cited. And um, and so I think you know if we could have some language that would acknowledge that and and include a, an expression of principle, that transportation funding should not exacerbate um, these these past uh, disproportionate impacts and should improve connectivity. And um, I, I think um, Director Spear may want to embellish a little bit on what I'm saying. She she and I were talking before the meeting, and she uh, wanted to make sure that. It, what we do, and actually, I see her hand up, so I I will should let her speak for herself here. But um, but we've tended, I think, I've seen this in the way uh, RTD has looked at its equity analysis that it only looks at where residents uh, live and doesn't look at um, say where they work and the need for mobility throughout the region and to. To look at job centers and things like that. So I realize this is maybe a lot. It's not something I have language prepared to offer tonight, but I do think this is something that it would really help include in here, and and that could help nudge the state towards um, applying a stronger uh, equity lens to its funding decisions. So 
that's uh, all I wanted to add. Well, actually, I did want to add one more thing. And, and Rich, again, thank you for for the um, the uh, language in the AAA area on transportation services um, and, and and Medicaid, and for people that are um, above Medicaid income eligibility, just. Um, you know, the beauty of a document like this is, is that Rich and, and our uh, contract lobbyists can, can speak on behalf of, on our behalf at the legislature when we can't always take a statement uh, or take a position. And I would also like us to look at um, language around um, Medicaid provider reimbursement rates. I'm very concerned about a situation up here in Boulder with a assisted living facility that um, is no longer going to serve Medicaid clients and leaving them um, really with little to no options <clears throat> in uh, Boulder County. And I, I know that this is a trend all over the state. So there's some areas where I think uh, we could really strengthen this and, and have a more proactive agenda. All right, thank you. Uh, Director Harrison. Go ahead. I'll uh, defer to uh, Director Spear since she okay. was uh, quoted before, and then I'll then I'll join up. All right, uh, Director Spear, go ahead. Oh, thank you so much for that, uh, Director Harrison. I just wanted to echo um, Director Levy's comments here. Um, and I think, you know, the only other thing that I would add is really just thinking about how people move around in the community a little more broadly be besides living and working, where people go to school, um, where, you know, the, the retail centers are, where they can get food, access to health care, and, and those sorts of things, too, as we're thinking about this broader um, definition of ec equity. So I would just echo what Director Levy was saying about thinking around how we can how we can shape the way that we are funding transportation um, to ameliorate some of the past inequities and make things better moving forward for the future. And also understanding it's a longer discussion um, than anything we can change tonight, but I would also love it if we could think about that for um, the next year's policy statement as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Harrison, go ahead. Thank you very much. Mine is just really brief on, on page seven in regard to the second bullet. And it talks about allocate additional state funds to support urban transit services in the Denver region. I just wanted a little bit more clarity in regard to what urban means. And you know, for us folks out in Erie, uh, we, we would be exurban or suburb or what have you. Um, does that cover um, what's going on in our area? Rich, uh, can you address that? I see Director Rex also unmuted. Yeah, I think I would refer to uh, Director Rex uh, for the better definition than I could give. I think on that. No, I, I, my oh, answer is simple. It's it's, <laughs> it's it's yes, Director Director Harrison. It does include um, all of Dr. Cog's uh, everybody within the MPO region. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you so much. Okay. Excellent. Thank That's you. Easy. Director. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Director Mulvey, you're up. Yeah, I noticed the same thing that Director Harrison did. It concerns me because of the way it might be perceived by the public or the readers of the document. Um, I'm glad that, you know, I know that in land use world, we're still considered urban, but in some respects, we're still rural, believe it or not, down here in Douglas County. So um, is there a way to mitigate how that might look to the public or the reader of the document? Rich or Doug? Yeah, I, I, I'll just offer a suggestion. Why don't we just take out urban altogether? That's what I was going to say. Yeah. That's what I would suggest. That that would, uh, that, that's what I was going to suggest as well. Just transit Thank services you. in the Denver region. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you, Director Molly. Good, good suggestion. Uh, any other questions or comments? Director Peck. Thank you. Um, I understand taking out the urban de 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 definition. However, as I mentioned on the uh, last board I was on, it is important as we look at the lack of transportation, both, uh, I know that regional is a huge issue, but I think that some of our municipalities are suffering for local transportation. And I would like it if 
Dr. Cog um, looked also at how we could enhance local intracity transportation. So I like that urban designation, but I do understand that it doesn't apply to everybody. If we just put transit in there as a generic term or transportation that covers the entire Dr. Cog region, I don't think we're really able to focus on intracity. And I don't know if the others feel that way, but I, I do think it is an important thing going forward as we're building out. Thank you. Uh, Director Mulvey, you wanna follow up? Uh, thank you, Director Peck. I would actually um, think that including urban would have a worse effect um, on your concern because while we're all technically zoned urban, um, you know, connecting between communities matters no matter where you are. And, you know, so for example, there are many places in Douglas County municipalities and unincorporated where you can't or connect to Douglas another location. Yeah. So I would, I would think that that, um, that we, that it does focus on that. Um, but I appreciate you raising it because it's a big concern down here in the South. Thank you. Uh, Director Peck. So I agree with you. I understand what you're saying, Director Mulvey. Um, and that's why I kind of use the term of intra-city as well as regional. And I don't know if Dr. Cog wants to go there. Um, but I just want to I just want to throw that out as a, a thought process moving forward. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. I can speak just uh, from my standpoint here in Denver. I live in a part of Denver that is not uh, very well served by transit. Uh, that when I uh, became elected and resigned from RTD, where I was working right before that, um, I didn't drive downtown to work a single day from Southwest Denver. I always had the an express bus. Now to get to my Bear Valley uh, City Council office in the shopping center, four miles away, it would take me 90 minutes by bus. So I've never even tried it. So I know it can be a challenge no matter where we are, whether we're in Erie or, uh, or whether we're in Longmont or no matter where we are. So I appreciate those observations. Any other questions, comments? If there are none, I would uh, like to ask if any member would uh, be willing to propose the motion that is on the item. Uh, Director Binkley. Oh, I don't want to propose anything. I just had okay. one last question. I'm sorry. Next. Go ahead. No, no problem. Go ahead. And if this sounds stupid, I apologize, everyone. But um, I know this is mostly about, if not all, about the transportation. But given what we were just talking about earlier about housing, I wonder, like, there's a lot of overlap there. Like, I know there's a lot of cities that want transportation to their city because they're not building housing, you know? Um, but I wonder if there needs to be something mentioned around there, you know what I mean? Not around that specifically, but just um, because of the overlap, but that's it. Hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Boy, you you really done it now. I got three more hands up. Uh, Director Coombs, go ahead. Oh, I was going to make the motion. I'm sorry? Oh, I was actually okay. going to make the motion. I see. Okay, yeah, go ahead and actually make, let's have the motion on the floor. It doesn't preclude discussion. Okay, great. Um, I move to approve Dr. Cog's legislative principle statement and the 2023 policy statement on state legislative issues. Thank you. Would someone like to second that? I'll go ahead and second it. And then I did want to make one additional comment. Excellent. Go ahead, Director Levy. Yeah, thanks. I apologize. I didn't have all my things open when I was speaking earlier. There are just two two other things I guess I was, was wondering about on page three. Um, we the bolded language about supporting legislative initiatives that foster transit oriented development. And it's focused, uh, the subparts are really focused mostly on what RTD can do here with, you know, to develop their land. And then we have the, the TIF language, but um, 
it it really seems like that's a broader issue than than just what RTD can do right around their stations. And mm -hmm. so I was just wondering whether that could be broadened a little bit um, about to to mention legislation that encourages or rewards local governments. Uh, that increased density around transit improvements. And this is going to be a big discussion in the legislature this session. And I really don't yeah. feel like we have broad enough language to address that. And then I and then I just also wondered the bolded language at the bottom of the page that says that Dr. Cox supports the use of comprehensive slash master plans as the foundation for local land use decision making. I I don't really know. I mean I know what that means. But I don't understand that in the context of what we're trying to do. A lot of the other statements in here, you know, even the preceding one about transit-oriented development, and I'm afraid that this just this blanket statement um, is going to tie our hands in participating in the main part of the governor's legislative agenda. And we're already seeing bills starting to come out. And if our position is just going to be that there shouldn't, you know, the master planning should be all that the state requires us to do. I'm, a, I think we're just not going to be able to fully participate in in all of this discussion. All right, thank you, uh, Mayor Starker. If you don't mind, I want to. Uh, Rich Morrow has his hand up, and then I think maybe he wanted to respond to some remarks and comments already made. So let me ask Rich to uh, if that was the the reason you've chimed in. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I was just commenting um, to uh, about Director Brinkley's mentioning of housing transportation connection, as I understood it. Um, we do have some language on housing um, on pages four and five, and I think it's on page five, there is a statement that um, at least touches on that. It may not address her, her whole concern, but we do have um, um, a statement about uh, supporting an adequate supply of permanently affordable housing located near job and transit hubs and continued public and private sector support of such an effort. Um, and I don't know if that answers her questions, but I think it, it might at least uh, move in that direction. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Starker. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was uh, going back to our discussion that we had on page seven about the uh, support for transit services. And okay. uh, just to add a little bit of uh, clarity language that, that may, uh, may uh, speak to some of the previous comments. And it would seem like instead of the Denver region, we would call it the Dr. Cog region because um, that's kind of the region that we're talking about. And maybe we add a line after that that says, uh, and support intra-regional transportation networks to talk about the, the, uh, uh, the links and transportation that we make from one community in our region to another. Okay. Any other comments on that, Rich? I mean, it sounds okay to me. Did did you you were you just suggesting the word interregional or did the the, the whole <laughs> of what I I didn't catch the end of it or, re, or <clears throat> I guess I was right. you know talking about making it the Dr. Cog region and then if right. we, if we needed to talk about something interregional, I just said interregional transportation networks just to come up with a phrase. I don't know if you know we can you can wordsmith that or take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. I think I see where where you're going with it. But it seemed like we were we were discussing about moving people from one one community in our region to another, and which I think is a great idea. Whether we're you know doing it with uh, Dr. Cog in its current configuration or other transportation networks that we can develop um, within the region. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, would that have to be an amendment or an edit to the document if the board wants to move in that direction? If you'd like to make it an amendment, I'm happy to make uh, make that wording amendment. Okay. Rich, uh, uh, Mayor Starker, what, what page is that on again? That's on page, page seven. seven. 
Yeah. At the, at okay. the uh, yellow highlighted area. Okay. Yeah, right there. Let me see that. So we take okay. urban out. I think was one thing we talked about. And so <clears throat> the transit services in the Dr. Cog region. And then if we want to add something referencing intra-regional transit or intra-regional networks. Yeah. <clears throat> and support inter-regional transportation networks or something to that effect. Rich, do you want to wor uh, wordsmith that and um, while I move on to some other comments? Sure. And then we have to see, obviously, if the board wants to move in that direction, uh, Mayor Starker. So uh, let me move on to Director. Thank you. Uh, let me move on to Director Harrison. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I think just tied back to what was originally talked about by Director Levy in regard to uh, on page three, the Dr. Cog supports legislative initiatives with RTD specifically. Um, I think because we are, I, I think us, our communities, Erie, Lafayette, others I know of just in the Northern area are looking at other alternative solutions to try to get those interregional transit opportunities going that might not involve RTD um, because of how long it may take to do and all of the other things. We're trying to look at creative solutions. And so I think when it comes to that page three, is there any way that we can maybe broaden it out, not just specific to RTD, but that's what I was supporting, wondering about. Yeah. Yeah. Supporting, supporting those that you know those municipalities within the dr car dr cog region that uh you know collaborate together on non-rtd solutions something to that effect um because just allow that flexibility yeah. there yeah i was looking i mean i i noticed that in um, um in the middle of that um highlighted area um on letter b mentions expanding the ability of RTD and local governments mm -hmm. and um, and C talks about protecting local authority. So I'm wondering if like in, in A, we could say something like providing regional transportation district and local local governments or whatever language. And or I would say prefer. and or local government um, solutions, creative solutions to transit oriented issues. Director Levy, is that kind of what you were thinking? I, I think that helps. It's very limiting to just mm -hmm. frame this in terms of park and ride facilities. So, yeah, I mm -hmm. think language that opens that up is okay. helpful. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Papsdorf, do you have something to uh, uh, add at this point? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Papsdorf, Transportation Planning and Operations Director at Dr. Cog. I thought maybe I should chime in at least a, a little bit. I, I think I, I don't have any particular concerns with sort of trying to broaden this language per se. I, I would point the board to probably the most important clause of this is the opening opening statement in this clause um, that Dr. Cog supports yeah. initiatives that foster transitory development, including but not limited to. That list of examples is not meant to be a limiting list or an exhaustive list. It's some examples of some specific issues um, that have been talked about in the past or have been highlighted in the past. So if the board if the board wants to add some additional language there or uh, qualify that or expand that language, I think that's fine. But I do want the board to understand that that list of those three examples is not a limiting list. It's not an exhaustive list. Those are some examples, some just some specific examples of things that could be could be addressed legislatively. But the most important part is actually just supporting initiatives that actually foster transitory development. Thank you. Now, Director Mulvey. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree with the modifications and the clarifications with one um, comment. We're, so uh, Director Peck talked about intercity and um, Director Sarker, I believe, talked about interregional, but I would submit that it's technically inter sub regional, which is really getting parsing the language, which then made me think maybe we want to keep it broad to just the. Um, the I like the idea, I just don't know how to say it, inter area, but 
if we say interregional, it might not capture everything. It's really more, in my view, inter subregional as well, because how can residents in Douglas County get to Denver when they have no way to get there with a multimodal option? They have mm -hmm. to use multimodals, too many to make it viable. Yeah. So that's right. more word junk for rich. Sorry. Uh, let, me, let me just clarify too. It sounds to me like what you're getting at is what we want to convey is that it there's there's I think we can have a similar idea of what regional transit would refer to, but you're also saying let's include um, what would be within jurisdictions transit, but also between jurisdictions transit. Is it like intra and inter? Yeah, but in, yeah, but also using different nouns, which is making it confusing. I think, and Director Peck can correct me if I'm misunderstanding. But that's the idea between going from you know Longmont, Louisville, and Boulder, for example, mm -hmm. and in Douglas County, not just going from Castle Plains to Castle Rock to Parker, but also being able to get to CTC or Littleton. Mm -hmm. So it's that's why I ended up with inter subregional, but it may be okay, now I came up with one. And this is word garbage. Intra Dr. Cog region one. I have no idea how to say that differently. Right. Uh, director Rex, executive director Rex. Help us out Thanks, here. sir, very much. I thought I'd take a shot at it too. And um, just trying to limit the number of words associated with. So, allocate additional state funds to support transit services within and among communities in the Denver region. Simpler is always better. As an old editor, I would say. Uh, and, the and then, may I? I'm sorry, Dr. Cog region instead of Denver region. I think or, or, I that. that's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Cog area. Yeah. And maybe, and Doug, maybe even where it says Dr. Cog supports legislative initiatives, we say state and local legislative initiatives that might cover those, those microcosms down to the local level. Oh, that's, is that back on, on page three? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on page We're Going seven. back and forth between seven and three. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Director Peck. Um, thank you, uh, Director Mulvey. I that is exactly what I did mean. Uh, intra regional as well as intra, but I really like what uh, Executive Director Doug Rex said. Um, I think that encapsulated what we were trying to say, but I can't really remember what you said. So can you repeat that? <laughs> okay. That's why he gets the big bucks. <laughs> Doug, can you repeat? Do it again. <laughs> Help us out here, Doug. All right. Um, I was actually just writing it out. So um, allocate additional state funds to support transit services within and among communities in the Denver or in Dr. the Dr. Cog. Cog area. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It covers it all. Sweet. Okay. Boom. Thank right. you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Now show us on the screen where that's going to go. Right there on that little yellow, yeah. yellow line there, right? Yep. Okay. So I know that you can't type into this PDF, but uh, so if all the board members are looking at this, uh, replace that yellow, uh, the yellow uh, line there with what Doug just said. And heaven help me, I couldn't repeat it if I tried. Uh, that's what we'll be voting on then. And I don't think under Robert's rules, do we need a motion to actually do that? Or is it sufficient? Uh, actually, let me ask the person who made the motion, uh, would they accept that? And then the person who seconded it. I think it was uh, Director Levy, you made the motion, correct? Oh, that's right. That's very convenient. I did. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> I, uh, actually, I, it was me, but um, I do accept Oh, I'm sorry. Director uh, Coombs, are you you're okay with that? Yep. Okay. Oh, that's right. I seconded it. Um, could I just raise though, so, um, you know, and again, we're trying to get this done tonight. So uh, we'll, 
my concerns about the language on comprehensive and, and master plans being the foundation. I mean, I think, yes, I fundamentally agree with that position. Um, I, I wouldn't want that to, to mean that we would not support um, some legislation that would strengthen, you know, that would provide maybe a, some more um, strength to these master plans. So I'll just leave that alone for right now because I, I really don't know how that fits in with a lot of the other conversation we've been having and we should just mm -hmm. look at that in the future. I was just going to suggest, um, given um, uh, Ron Papsdorf's, uh, Dorf's gloss on that other bolded language, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm on page three now, on um, that the legislative initiatives that foster transit-oriented development, um, the lawyer in me can't help but um, <laughs> cite the, the Latin phrase, "edustum generis, where the, the okay. list is intended really to be an example of, of the including but not limited to, and Deborah Mulvey's smiling. Um, Okay. So could we just put a period F at the end of foster transit oriented development period and then say, in addition, Dr. Cog supports, et cetera. And, and I think uh, Director Harrison had, a, um, had, had some new language for that subpart A. I think that would help make that a standalone principle that we support mm -hmm. initiatives that foster transit-oriented development without any implication that that A, B, and C are the primary means, not exclusive mm -hmm. means, but the primary means. Thoughts on that? Director Mulvey? I could go either way on that because I think it, um, I think a fair reading of the general public would would take it to mean all those and including but not limited to. Mm -hmm. So I'm good with the way it is, but I don't have major problems if it changes. Certainly. And again, as an old retired editor, I uh, it's a, certainly a run on sense, but uh, putting a period there wouldn't change the, the meaning. And thank you for introducing Latin. To, uh, to my first, my the first time I chaired a Dr. Cog meeting with Latin. I'm an old altar boy, so I, I, I didn't know your reference. I just remember a confitier to Deum, right? So I don't speak that kind of Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Director Peck. Thank you. To your question, uh, Chair Flynn, do we need a motion on the amendment? I think actually we do, and then we we vote on the. Uh, article itself as amended, the policy statement. Okay. So Thank two, you. I think uh, it's two motions. Okay, since, we, uh, uh, since we've kind of moved off that, let me go back and talk about that uh, page three, that one line that we substituted uh, Doug Rex's uh, language. That was page uh, seven. I'm sorry, page seven. Uh, Director Peck, you wanna make a motion that we amend that sentence to say what Doug said? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, okay, hold, hold on. I've got it pulled up on a different screen. Uh, okay, um, I move that we amend uh, the on page seven, where it says allocate additional state funds to support urban transit service in the Denver uh, region to read. I've got to get back to my other screen. Um, allocate additional state funds to support transit services within and among communities in the Dr. Cog area. Excellent. Is there a second? Second, Harrison. Thank you, Director Harrison. Uh, E.D. Rex, do you have a comment? Unmute, please. Um, yes, Here sir, you. I'm sorry. I almost hate to bring this up, but I just want to make sure that the, if there's a better parameter Parliamentarian than me in the room, um, because there's a there's a motion and a second on the floor now <coughs> without a vote. And I don't know if this is right. what we're referring to as just a friendly amendment to this or not. Well, it could have been. Okay, let, let me say that uh, at least at Denver City Council, when there's a motion on the floor, you can supersede that with a motion to amend 
And if it's successful, then you make a motion to adopt the the initial as a, the initial motion as amended. Uh, that's how we do it at Denver. I don't know if that's different uh, with the other jurisdictions here. I don't think we necessarily have to table or or uh, vote on the the uh, initial uh, motion. Uh, Director Shaw. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We would take each amendment at a time. So we'd vote on this amendment. And then right. if someone likes to propose another amendment, we would vote on that. And then we would vote on the document as amended. But each amendment Correct. would be voted on separately. Correct. That's that's how, uh, that's how our body uh, does its amending. Uh, Director yeah. Coombs. Yeah, so I think that's generally true unless the people who moved in second take it as a friendly amendment and then you don't have to do that extra round of voting, which I think um, that Director Levy and I both agreed that that would be a friendly amendment. So maybe we don't have to do the extra round of voting. Okay, uh, we already have a motion to amend it. So let me just let me just say everyone in favor of that, please unmute and say aye. 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 And this, and this Aye. is on. Okay, Aye. thank you. Any opposed? <laughs> Are there any opposed? Say no. And please don't. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any abstentions? <laughs> Seeing none, uh, we have now amended that uh, sentence on page seven. Uh, uh, Director Levy, are you going to uh, propose another amendment to the document? Yes, I am. Um, and, and that would be going back to page three. Um, okay. on the bolded language, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Cox supports legislative initiatives that foster transit oriented development. I would propose that we put a period there. And then we have a new sentence that begins, um, in addition, Dr. Cog supports, uh, and then I'm struggling a little bit. I think Director Harrison had had a revision to this, um, providing um, what I think our regional transportation district and local governments with mm -hmm. the ability to, and I would strike manage park and ride facilities and say with the ability to use best practices to help the region reduce vehicle miles travel. Okay, Director, uh, Mr. Papsdorf. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, if Director Levy is um, willing, I have been listening to the conversation. I did draft up some potential language for that section on page three, if you'd like to see it, and Melinda would let me share it on the screen for you all to peruse. Oh, I would appreciate that. Uh, let's see if I can do this now here. <laughs> Okay, I think that should be it. Let me see if I can make that a little bit larger. Can you see that on the screen, Mr. Chair? Yes, we can, or I can. So um, listening to the two directors language, um, this, would, this would replace that section. Um, it adds the period as Director Levy was suggesting, Dr. Cox supports legislative initiatives that foster transitory development period. Dr. Cog also supports initiatives that A, and I'm adjusting that A section a little bit, provide the regional transportation district and local jurisdictions. Sorry, I forgot the and as I was writing. And local jurisdictions with the ability to manage parking facilities using best practices that help the region reduce vehicle miles traveled. B, local infrastructure investment support. Um, and then C, picks up with the existing B and D, uh, that language would remain the same. Okay, and uh, we'll fix the typo there on the last word as well, right? Thank you very much, yes. Okay, thank you. That That is very, very helpful. Director Levy, does that? Uh... I appreciate that, yeah. I think that captures it. Okay, thank you. So you're making that motion. Is there a second to that amendment to the document? I'll second the uh, motion, Chair Austin from Broomfield. Thank you, Director Ward. Uh, Director Shaw. Sorry, I was there to second. No problem. OK, thank, thank you. you, Director Ward. Thank you, uh, Director Mulvey. 
Yeah, is the does the language still include local authority to use tax increment financing? Uh, Director Levy, it does. It, it would re, it would uh, retain those last two pieces. It just would re-letter them to be C and D Thank instead you. of B and C. That's what I got. Thank you for clarifying. Excellent. Uh, so we uh, let's vote on this motion. All in favor of amending uh, that uh, section of the document to read. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it because it's no longer on the screen. Uh, please uh, unmute and say aye. 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 Thank you. Are there any opposed? Please say no. Hearing none, are there any abstentions? Excellent. Uh, Rich, do you can take care of that for us? Uh, yes, if Ron sends me the language, <laughs> which he will. Uh, okay. Yeah, and we, I think we have it with between me, Ron, Doug, and uh, Melinda, I think we will get it uh, taken care of for you. Thank you very much. And I Excellent. want to thank everybody for this discussion. It's been very right. helpful. I'm, I'm afraid to ask if there are any other suggestions for amendments. Uh, Director Shaw. I don't have any other suggestions for amendments, but I do um, move to adopt the document as amended. Yes, thank you. Is there a, is there a second to that? I'll second. Ms. Sally. Thank you, Director Daigle. Uh, is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please unmute and say aye to adopt. Aye. 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 As amended. Aye. Thank you. Is there, are there any uh, no votes? Please say no. Hearing none, are there any abstentions? Glendo abstains. Oh, who, I'm sorry, who abstained? Glendo abstains. Direct, Director Binkley. Thank you. Uh, Melinda, please uh, make note of that. And uh, thank you very much. Let's move on to, uh, now I gotta find the uh, agenda here. There it is. <clears throat> move on to our informational briefings. Uh, our uh, first one is RTD's uh -huh. Zero Fare for Better Air update. Uh, Jacob Rieger, you are going to introduce this for us. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, we wanted to give the board an update on RTD's participation in last year's Zero Fare for Better Air campaign uh, during the summer ozone season. So I have the easy job of introducing our speaker from RTD. Please welcome Charlie Stanfield, uh, planning project manager with RTD, who will update you on RTD's uh, participation in that program and what they found. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. And, and bear with me here as I get my slide deck up. Can everybody see that? Uh, that is excellent. I can see it. If anyone cannot, raise your hand. Go ahead. Great. Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak. I'm going to give a, a brief presentation on our Zero Fare for Better Air initiative, which um, occurred in August 2022. So this initiative came out of SB 22180, which was um, signed by the governor in the, at near the beginning of summer, and it established the ozone season free transit grant program. Um, this was a grant program that was administered by the Colorado Energy Office and provides funding to transit agencies to, to provide free transit services for at least 30 days during the ozone season. And this was defined as June 1st to August 31st in the bill. And what this bill did was it created two pots of funds. One was for the Colorado Association of Transit Agencies, CASTA, um, allocated them $3 million per year for two years and they acted as a conduit basically for all the smaller transit agencies to participate in the program. And the bill also allocated $11 million per year for two years for RTD to participate with a 20% local match from RTD required. And so after this bill was passed, we, we started doing some initial planning and identifying additional needs that as an agency we expected we'd need during a zero fare uh, month. And, those were additional cleaning of our vehicles and facilities due to increased use of our services, additional security, and then increases to our light rail capacity. We also started uh, putting together a marketing campaign. We developed a lot of marketing material that you see here and put this out in digital media, print media, had radio ads, really trying to get the word out to let people know, hey, RTD is gonna be zero fare for the month of August. Get your car, come on board, let's try it out. 
And all of our services during this month were free. All 10 of our rail lines, over 100 bus routes. We operate 24 flex ride areas that were zero fare. Uh, these operate on demand in more suburban areas of the, of the district. And as well as our complimentary paratransit services, we are federally required to provide um, paratransit services to those who cannot access our fixed route. And so those services were also free during this month. As far as our costs, the, the biggest expense that we, we incurred during this month was foregone fair revenue. Our 2022 budget for August uh, projected a little under $9.3 million in fair revenue uh, for the month of August. Uh, additional expenses that we expected and uh, incurred at various levels were uh, the, the rail operations, so adding that capacity to our light rail services, marketing and public relations, security and cleaning, as well as an impact assessment. We, we did incur a few expenses that were non-reimbursable. Um, those included marketing and PR expenses incurred before July 26th, which was when our grant agreement was executed and we, we were allowed to actually incur expenses, as well as a customer survey that was um, deemed outside the scope of the grant program. All in, all in we uh, expended about $10.3 million uh, for putting on the Zero Fare for Better Air initiative. As far as ridership, everybody wants to know, you know, how did this turn out with, with ridership? We had good results overall, 22% uh, increase in ridership uh, from July, 2022. I will caveat that we, uh, August is always a, a higher month for us uh, than July as far as ridership. And between 2016 and 2021, our August ridership uh, increased between 2% and 12%. We also saw that much of this ridership was retained in September. So, uh, great to see on that front. As part of the effort, we also conducted a customer survey. And what this was, was uh, basically we um, had, had a firm that called a bunch of people in the, in the Denver region. And the first question was, did you ride RTD services um, during the month of August? If you answered no, the survey ended. If you answered yes, then you could uh, go through the full survey. And what we found is 91% of uh, respondents had previously used RTD services. So 9% were actually new customers. 55% um, increased their usage during zero fare and 60% of respondents were motivated by cost. And finally, I'll, I'll touch on that impact assessment that I referenced earlier. Uh, this, we really, we, we did this because we wanted to uh, understand how going zero fare affected our operations, it affected our, our frontline employees and how it affected our customers and ways that we could improve if, if we went and implemented this again. Um, so as I noted, regular transit ridership increase, but the catalysts are unclear. Uh, in addition to August being a higher month for RTD in terms of transit ridership, we're also you know, coming back from the pandemic, people are slowly returning to work. So it's, it's really a difficult time to understand and try to figure out exactly what the effect of a zero fare month had on ridership. Um, the second takeaway is that we absorbed the increased ridership that we saw without uh, substantial increases in service. We uh, did not notice significant overcrowding or anything like that, so that was uh, great to see. Um, the third takeaway is there was no major increase to quality of life or crime incidents. It was uh, fairly stable from July through September. Um, as I mentioned, there was a pretty extensive use of paratransit services, and this would have uh, big cost implications uh, in, in the future, and it did have big cost implications uh, during the month of August as well. Our, uh, it's an inefficient service, and just that in the nature, it operates door to door. And so without a fare there to act as a barrier, um, there's not a lot of disincentive to use the service. So it's, it, would, it becomes very popular and it's difficult to uh, meet the demand uh, created by that. And finally, the, the impacts to air quality are difficult to quantify. Um, there are so many factors that go into assessing air quality and you know, public transit is such a small sliver of the overall input into that. Um, it's, it's difficult to quantify. We, one piece of data that we're working on um, for a possible 2023 should our board and general manager decide to go that route um, and implement this program again is um, understanding what percentage of that increase in ridership were people that would have otherwise driven a single occupancy vehicle. And you know we saw a 22% increase in ridership, but understanding um, you know 
many of those people would have walked or they may have not taken their trip at all. And so understanding who would have actually driven their car instead of taking transit is necessary to assess those impacts. So that's all I've got. I'm happy to take any questions anyone might have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stansfield, appreciate it. Uh, Director Harrison, go ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Stansfield for doing this. Um, I guess one question that I would have is in reference to, do we have any data that's specific to where those riders uh, embarked onto the train and where they departed in terms of part of the region, whether it's closer into the city, more to the central core, or all the way out to the external parts or at the end of those rail lines or bus lines or what have you, whatever it may be. I know that's hard to, to quantify, maybe on the bus side and on the rail side, it might be a little easier to do. Um, and then also, what impact did COVID have on people wanting to get in close proximity to people on a bus, on a train, et cetera. Was there any sort of um, feedback on that or a question in regard to that? Um, so to answer your first question, we, we don't have that exact data. Since we're kind of an open system, we require, you know, if you have a smart card, you pay your fare, you tap when you get on the bus or, you know, rail, you, you tap your card, or you may just have a paper ticket. So um, you know, for this level of analysis, we didn't have that data. It's something that um, we have dug into in the past, but for this specific effort, did not look into that uh, specific origins and destinations. And then um, your second question, as far as COVID, um, there were no COVID specific questions as far as our customer survey. We, I think there are still some folks who are hesitant to ride because of, uh, you know, COVID concerns and that sort of thing. Um, but it, it's something that I think the industry is, is shedding uh, as we kind of emerge from the pandemic. Okay, and then one more follow-up question. Go, if you can go back to the slide where the graph, the bar graph that you had, because uh, there was one thing, yeah, right there. So we saw for bus way up uh, just under 250,000 in August of 2019. So that was, do we know as to why that was so high or was that normal? all the way up to 2019. And then now what we see now here is more the new normal when it comes to bus ridership. Exactly, that's that this is what it was for pre pandemic. That was our kind of our last full run board that we had before the pandemic hit. And what you're seeing in September, August, July, that's kind of the new normal that we're at now. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um... Thanks for the presentation. I think this is really encouraging overall. The the pre the slide immediately before this one on costs. Um, I wasn't sure how to interpret um, the the incurred expenses came in below the approved grant amount. And so is that? Um, are you then turning money back to the state, or did you did you simply not draw down the the entire amount that was appropriated for this? Sure, yeah. So basically this was a reimbursement. So we incurred the expense and then the state reimburses us up to 80% of those costs. And so the, we're just not drawing down the, the available grant funding, exactly. And the reason for the, um, the difference, you know, we had expected adding additional uh, rail capacity to our light rail system that we ultimately did not need. So we scaled that back. And then some of the marketing and, and PR costs uh, were incurred before the date uh, that um, the grant agreement was executed. So we technically weren't allowed to reimburse them. Uh, and then uh, security and cleaning, that was basically a staffing issue. We did not, simply didn't ha have the staff to uh, add additional cleaning or additional security out there. Do, do you, that that's actually very encouraging. It's great because it may mean uh, you, you know, in, in 2023 and potentially if this is uh, expanded, that the cost of doing it might not be as large as what was forecast. Do you feel like these numbers will will hold? Um, I, I, you know, the, the biggest thing here is the fair revenue. It's, it's, it is a big number. Um, it is, while overall a small part of our budget is, it is still, still a substantial figure. And so that's really the, I think the biggest number that, that, uh, as an agency, we're concerned about because all the other ones are relatively minor. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's understandable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I have, I do have one question, uh, Charlie. And that is, 
uh, we are going to do this again next year because this is a two year program. Is that Correct. what I understand? Okay. There is, will yeah, it, there's two years of funding. Um, ultimately, that will fall to our board of directors to elect in, you know, to participate in the program in 2023. Okay. And, but I know uh, there's, um, you know, we had a positive experience. Yes, bank traffic is skyrocketing until this happens. I'm sorry. What do you uh, wish? So it might, uh, would it be in August again or would it, could it be any month it, during it the ozone be, season? Yeah, exactly. It could be any month from June to August. I know that there are discussions uh, about uh, how we want to approach 2023 and those are ongoing. All right, thank you. And Director Levy, did you have another comment? Oh, Director Daigle, go ahead. And the only comment that I, I have as far as not knowing when the month is, um, a lot of people that I, that I have talked to that ride the bus uh, didn't know about the uh, no fee in August until August was almost over. They didn't wow. find out about that. And so uh, if you're gonna, you know, just pick a random month, say, you know, in May you decide it's gonna be July, can you start advertising that early enough so people actually, you know, are able to catch yeah. the ride for free? No, cer certainly, yeah. And, um, you know, the bill, last year's bill was passed I, I think it was the end of May um, and so we we had we had to ramp up very quickly uh, right. and Understood. I think the intent this year is to have that earlier and 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 approach that and having a longer timeline to really get the word out because we did hear from some people but as everyone knows it's difficult to reach everyone uh, you know we can try as hard as we can but people will always fall through the cracks and not uh, hear about certain uh, campaigns or things that we're running so uh, definitely the longer lead time we have, the better we'll be able to get the word out. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Stanfield, thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, next up is, I believe Rich, you're up again. Uh, hold on, uh, scrolling all over creation here. 2023, yes, 2023 legislative session preview. And Rich, you we have uh, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle here. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was going to give a little bit of an intro, but because of the time we spent on the policy statement, which I really appreciated, again, the engagement, um, I'll cut my remarks short and just turn it over to Ed and Jen. Okay, thank you. Ed and Jen, you're on. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Director Flynn. Hello, everyone. My name is Jen Castle. I am part of your lobby team. Um, happy New Year and happy day 10 of, of the legislative session. We only have 110 more to go. Um, and today, today was a snow day for us. Um, the Capitol did not, uh, did not meet. Um, so to give a little bit of a preview, I want to make note that um, the outcome of the November election is really what is setting the tone for the Capitol. Um, for any of you that are not aware, um, we did um, experience a, a blue wave in Colorado. The Democrats gained five seats in the House, which is going to give them a majority of 46 to 19, which is in fact a super majority um, for the Democrats. I believe that's the largest majority that either party has held um, in our history. The Democrats also gained two seats in the Senate. So the, the split in the Senate is now going to be 23 to 12. So really this dynamic um, and still, and the Democrats still holding the Democratic trifecta is really going to speak to a lot of the legislation that we see introduced this session. We have over 30 new members of the legislature. Um, so a lot um, of incoming freshmen, almost half of the House is brand new. Um, we only have two new members in the Senate. So a lot of the institutional knowledge um, is going to be found um, in the Senate. We do still have one vacancy that is has yet to be filled. Uh, a few things did want to highlight, though, is as well that a lot of the new incoming freshman legislators, or I guess they're not incoming anymore. They've already been sworn in. Um, the new the new legislators um, really have strong local government backgrounds. Um, we have 
um, at least five that I can think of on the top of my head, um, some city council members, some former county commissioners, and then of course, most recently, um, one of our own directors, um, Representative William Lindstedt um, from Broomfield is, um, is, is in the house now. So we're going to have great representation down at the Capitol. And Ed and I certainly look forward to working with all the new legislators moving forward. To highlight just a, a few priorities of both of the chambers and the majority party, usually the first couple of bills that are introduced um, really highlight what the parties are going for, um, what their priorities are going to be. Um, both chambers and the majority party mentioned and really stressed that they want Colorado to be more affordable, especially as it relates to housing, healthcare, childcare as well. So Senate Bill 1, so the first bill in the Senate is going to be a bill to expand public-private partnerships for affordable housing. Um, it, it's a way for the state to really be part of um, affordable housing or to have them into enter into the affordable housing space. Um, then House Bill 1001 is going to increase incentives and financial assistance um, for educators to get into the workforce. Um, this is going to the goal of this one is to is to help. Um, address the state teacher shortage that we have. So those are the number one bills in both the Senate and the House. Some of the other major priorities that, that the legislature has indicated is they want to put more resources towards uh, mental health, wildfire prevention, climate change. Um, we know the Governor Polis has also indicated some similar priorities, and we do expect him to, to be an active player in the legislative process again this year. It has been a little bit of a slow start, um, we've only seen about 100 or so bills introduced, but of course, as you all know, there's going to be a lot more to come. I'm going to hand it over to Ed to do a little bit of a budget update, and then we'll we'll mention some, some large policy bills um, that we see on the horizon as well, too. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Rich and all the members. Um, we do spend a lot of time working on the budget issues. Um, this year, the significant federal relief dollars that were provided the last few years have all been allocated. Um, there's some adjustments to be made, but we're not going to have those dollars the way we have the last few years. Our general fund revenues, our tax revenues are still increasing, but slowing in their rate of increase. Things are slowing down a bit, um, and the state continues to have uh, significant TABOR refunds. Um, great time to be a taxpayer. You get your refund. Tougher for the state when all this money has to go back out the door. Um, some of the major policy bills that we know about that will impact local governments. First, there's going to be a suggested rewrite to the Open Records Act. Again, that would impact every public entity in the state. Um, there's uh, already discussions about property tax reform. Um, last year, there was um, some money put aside to decrease the residential and non-residential assessment rates. There's already talk about modifications to that. Um, this year will be a reassessment year. So around May 1st, um, everyone will get their biennial um, uh, property evaluation. Um, and that would be reflect, uh, everyone is anticipating those will be quite uh, significant increases over the prior two years. Um, finally, um, our executive director talked about some of the land use issues that are coming up as well that the governor um, and others are pushing in terms of promoting density, promoting more use of public transit, um, and promoting more affordable housing options. Some of the issues that we're expecting for Dr. Cog include a continued focus on elder abuse, nursing home, financial transparency, and legislation on age discrimination. So that's just a brief overview. Um, certainly Jennifer and I um, uh, work very closely with Rich and even saw Doug up there earlier this week as well. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Jennifer and Ed. Let's have some uh, discussion. Rich, do you wanna kick it off? Do you have any summation for us or we just go into uh, questions and comments? Um, I would just add uh, a couple of quick things before uh, comments, just to note uh, for the directors. So because of the timing that was indicated with the legislature uh, opening up two days before the board packet went out, uh, given the direction from the board in the past, we didn't really have time to um, present bills to you for positions 
uh, tonight, we do anticipate having uh, a fair number to present to you in February at the February board meeting. And sure. um, we'll have, uh, uh, I, most of you know that I prepare a, a matrix of bills with uh, descriptions, staff comments, tying it to uh, any recommended positions to the board policy statement, which you just adopted. So I, I, I thought I'd highlight that. Um, and then I'd be interested in any comments from the board. Great. All right, thank you. Director Levy, you're up first. Yeah, thank you. I have a question that maybe for Ed or, or Jennifer. You know, there, there's been a lot of um, a lot of effort over the years in workforce in um, for uh, school teachers, uh, early childhood education, et cetera, some of these other areas. And um, I'm wondering whether you're hearing any um, any concerns or effort around um, long-term care facility um, providers work uh, that kind of workforce. Um, I know years ago there there was some talk around wages and availability uh, um, of long-term care providers, but it's it's um, approaching crisis and. And the silver tsunami is already here. It's not just in the offing. So I was kind of wondering about that, what you're hearing in that area. Um, yes, uh, Commissioner Levy, um, very much so. Um, most of the discussion has been around direct care service providers, um, DSP, direct care providers, um, that the even tomorrow, the Joint Budget Committee is going to be considering a supplemental in that area. Um, to provide more funding for direct care providers for individuals who work in the community-centered board system. But we're hearing it throughout the um, continuum of direct care providers as well. Um, there hasn't been as much focus on it, as you point out, as we've seen with the teachers and educators um, and, and, and that kind of career pathway, but it has been a focus. Okay, and I was specifically thinking of the long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities. Yeah. And and nursing homes. Yeah. Yeah. And Rich may, may have a better perspective on that than, than me. All I would add is I know that HICPUF has, um, um, I don't know if it's a supplemental or a budget amendment um, addressing um, reimbursement rates for nursing homes that they're gonna do. Uh, I don't have the details to give tonight, but I know they're, they're working on something for that. But I agree that there, there's, a, there's a real big need for uh, a serious effort to address the, the staffing issues throughout the, the long-term care continuum. And I would be more than happy. I know our ombudsman program folks would be more than happy to be have, have me and the lobbyists work with um, any of our member jurisdictions uh, to pursue something around that at the legislature. Right, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> you may be hearing from us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Director Harrison, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and, and to that uh, point, uh, Rich, mm -hmm. um, having an uncle who mentally handicapped, lived in a group home for over 40 years of his life, also is 77 years old, during the pandemic, the group home that he was associated with, they closed up shop because they didn't have the financial resources to keep it open. And so all of a sudden, within a week, he went into the hospital uh, for something else. Within that week that he was in the hospital, the group home shut down because of the pandemic and had no place to go afterwards. And all those residents were basically, they had to defer to their families to take them in or some other emergency situation of others that would take them in. And so the, the story for my uncle, when he got out of the hospital, he couldn't stay with us because of COVID and the concerns about his health and what could have transpired during that time. We had to find emergency uh, shelter for him in terms of short-term or group home sort of situation. It was actually a host home down in Parker and he had grown up in Denver his whole entire life. So for somebody of that, particular state had to go somewhere completely new. Thankfully, he's very adaptable. But then from there, had some health issues. Then we need, then they couldn't handle him because of that, um, because they weren't licensed for it. 
Then we had to find another home for him to go up to, which took him all the way up to Boulder to, to imagine uh, and what they have, facilities they have available. Um, and then we're finally able to situate him here close to where I live in Erie with, in a group home. But I think that's sort of endemic or emblematic of uh, a population that has no net for them to be able to handle. And where did they go? And and they're and they are the the most you know vulnerable of all because they can't speak for themselves and they can't do what they need. And if they didn't, if I wasn't around, I don't know where you would be. So I think those are the things that need to be focused on in reference to that. So that's my first question. Is there anything that you can state about that sort of situation? I would just say, I guess what I was saying is I, I'm not knowledgeable <clears throat> on like the statutes or regulations uh, around group homes. But I do know just from experience um, with uh, Jayla, our, our area agency on aging director and um, Shannon and others in our uh, ombudsman program when it comes to nursing homes and assisted living residences, um, I think there is a process in place. Uh, it's probably inadequate given um, sometimes the real issue is there just isn't any place to go. Um, but there is a process in place sometimes for the state to get involved. The ombudsman oftentimes get involved in helping to try to find beds or placements in other facilities. Um, I know in the past, there have been times when they've even looked out of state to find places if they had to. Um, but it's just, it's just always just a very real difficult situation. A lot, a lot of it has to do with funding. And, and during the process, yeah. I found out that, and this is kind of tying to my next question, which is um, they are in the lower 40s of the 50 states when it comes to funding for these, for these group of people and for those in group homes and nursing homes, assisted living, all those areas, that in my mind, just personal experience is pathetic when it comes to values. And I would like to see something change in regard to that um, because they are the most vulnerable. And then, so that's my first one. The second one goes on to education. So you had mentioned earlier, uh, Jen, I think mentioned earlier in regard to trying to attract teachers to the state of Colorado from a funding perspective in terms of providing maybe more salary. Being the husband of a, of a 21 year teacher who uh, has since uh, retired from that because of a variety of reasons, um, just to say that, a, and put it into perspective in real world, um, she has two master's degrees and at the end of her 21 years was making $68,000 a year. So if you're going to, if you, she's more educated than I am and others, and probably 80% of the people out there, those are the type of teachers that are out there teaching our kids in public schools. And to pay them that kind of wage a, is, is pretty laughable. Um, in combination with the high affordability, they can't live in the Denver Front Range area on their own with that kind of salary that they're making unless they are married to somebody who's making more money or they're rooming with a bunch of good people or they live on the front range uh, or uh, way out in the plains where something is affordable and then they have to commute in 45 minutes to an hour for their work. So I think more than just salary, is there's more substantive in terms of the funding side of things that also we are very low in the low 40s in funding for education in our state. Yeah. And so I think that's, again, something else that has to be looked at beyond just the, you know, here's a salary thing. There has to be something else there. And so I think those, that whether it's Tabor, which has always come up, the negative factor that comes in with the fact that we're, I think the last I remember, a billion dollar deficit in terms of education funding over the last how many years. Um, that our, our state is only going to be successful if we can educate our, our kids and be, be able to have them grow up and be productive members of society. And if we're not willing to make that investment, they're going to go somewhere else. And I think that's something that, that again, hopefully we're going to do from a lobbying perspective to take a look at. Well, and I would add, and 
provide adequate care for all of us who've been right. spending our lives working <laughs> when we get older. Um, yeah, I, think, I think that the governor uh, pledged in his state of the state to, uh, I think, get rid of the budget stabilization factor by the end of his term, so four years. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's also, again, a proposal, not a total solution, but as I understand it, a proposal that will be heavily debated to put a, uh, a, a measure on the ballot to retain Tabor refunds to use for uh, education. That's as much as I know about it. Yeah. Um, so these things, I mean, we, we keep having these conversations every year. And um, again, they're just, they're always a struggle. Yeah, and, and I'll just put it in perspective in the salary type of, of range. So the, the money that she, my wife was making at the end of her career was less than what a entry-level customer service agent in the IT industry would make, which is about eighty to $90,000 a year. So that, 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 again, if you want to attract teachers, you got a lot. You got a you got a big hill to climb, and plus we're having declining enrollment in in our state, and that's probably part of the reason. So, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Daigle. Wow, um, Director Harrison, that was a lot. <clears throat> but um, a couple of things you, Rich, you mentioned that Hikva was talking about. Uh, a refund process for nursing homes? Well, it's the reimbursement rates that they get paid um, through the Medicaid program. Right. Um, so to uh, Director Harrison's um, uh, dissertation almost, because that was, that was a lot, but very important. And I really appreciate it because uh, in-home health services, uh, group homes, mm -hmm. those are the ones that are for not being cared for. I myself, I'm a nurse and have been for over 30 years. Um, uh, nursing homes don't necessarily need more, unless the reimbursements are going to go to pay nurses that also only make about $68,000 um, a year and work their rears off, unless they're you know, working a lot of overtime, then they really make the big money. But um, some nurses, teachers, uh, if, if we could get that money back to them, that would make a huge difference. Um, also help with housing, I would agree with that. Uh, but uh, no, are they talking about the in-home health services, any, any kind of money going towards them because because of the pandemic, I believe that there's probably many, many, many more folks that are staying home with elderly uh, parents or uh, parents that were affected by COVID or even just family members. Uh, and because of all of those group homes having to close and there were multiple of them that closed families had to take in a member. And then many of them don't even know about the in-home health services to be, you know, to get some kind of funding. Um, myself, that's, that's what I'm doing right now. I am staying home with my mother 24 seven, Lord help me. Um, and uh, by the time all is said and done, I think I make about five bucks an hour and get only 50 hours a week but I'm 24 seven. So, uh, you know, if there's, if you have any sway in that, you know, when they're talking about, you know, uh, giving reimbursements, Medicare reimbursements to nursing homes, ask if they can add in those group homes, those in-home health services, because those, uh, those are also some really huge needs as well. And I am so, so very sorry Director Harrison, about your uh, your uncle, that's that is a crying shame, and I totally agree. If we if we want this state to move forward, we need to take better care of our children and 
to that point, we are number 48 out of 50 for funding for schools. Um, uh, we need to take care of our children and our elderly or we're not gonna go anywhere. And that's just any society that, that throws away their, their widows, their children and their elderly will fail in no time. We will turn into a Babylon. So thank you, thank you very much, Director Harrison for uh, your struggles. And thank you, Rich, for fighting the good fight. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director Binkley. Hey, y'all. Sorry to be such a pain tonight. Um, Director Harrison, preach. I've been a DPS teacher for the past 17 years. I quickly looked up these bills that were coming up um, for the on the education part, and it seems like they're not dealing with salary at all, only with like student loan reimbursement, um, which I'm sure is great for people, but not helpful for everyone. I mean, the median house price in Denver right now is five hundred and sixty two thousand um, dollars. I live in Glendale for this reason. <laughs> like, <laughs> I would love to have a backyard. Glendale has zero houses. Um, so this is something that's near and dear to my heart, but I would say if anything, Rich, sorry to be a pain for you again, but is there any way we can look into maybe exactly what those bills say? Because I, I think somebody mentioned salary, but I didn't read that in there, but I did just quickly skim it. That's it. I'd like I to would just say that. that I think, and, and maybe Ed should jump in because he's definitely knowledgeable on this area. I think addressing teacher salaries is covered in the budget. And there's also a, usually a big uh, school finance bill that gets introduced at the end of the session. Um, so that may be where those get covered. That's exactly right, Rich. That's where that would come up um, in the School Finance Act, which would probably be introduced in April. Great, thank you. Uh, Director Coombs. Um, yes, thank you. Um, while we're on the topic of kind of funding for care programs and care workers, um, I know that past bills have required that the reimbursement rate increases go to staffing um, and to care providers. So if there can be kind of pushing for that to um, continue in whatever gets brought forward this session. Um, and then the other issue that I have heard a lot about <laughs> is um, the different reimbursement rates for inside Denver and outside Denver. So right now um, for Medicaid providers, for direct services, particularly within CCBs, if you're in Denver, you get a higher rate than if you're not in Denver. And I think for our region, um, given that we share actually a lot of the same struggles around uh, cost of housing, as well as um, attracting and retaining people to do this work, um, that there should be an examination of that inside Denver, outside Denver differential. Um, at bare minimum, looking at the metro region as being included within the inside Denver instead of it just being city and county of Denver limits. That will be all I'll say, although I could have a lot more to say about this subject. That's a, that's a good suggestion. And I, I was gonna say earlier that I have uh, I always try to make the point that if you're gonna increase rates, the first thing you ought to look at is is having, having those uh, increases go to uh, salaries. Because uh, the, the industry is com rightfully complaining all the time about staffing problems. So um, taking care of uh, the, uh, the workers and, and the workforce issues as part of any rate increase, I think is an important idea. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I know we're all looking forward to uh, your next uh, matrix, Rich, and uh, with <laughs> some with anticipation, some with dread. And I'm looking forward to making it up for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, let's move on to, uh, hold on, let me check. Okay, no no more hands up. Uh, let's move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Strategic Plan. 
uh, from Greg McKinnon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am giving a uh, short um, informational briefing on the document. It's available <laughs> through attachment H, uh, the link within the memo. Uh, and we expect to be coming back uh, to uh, this group um, uh, next month for action. And I guess I better check to make sure that you can see my my sharing screen before going on. I see it, and I'm assuming if I can see it, everyone else does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And oops. Okay. So what what is our uh, regional transportation operations and technology uh, RTO and T? What is that? What we're talking about is uh, multiple agencies and jurisdictions uh, having to work together, multiple multiple modes, and provide services to our um, our travelers in the region. Uh, this is you know, focusing on day to day operations and also uh, 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 building better services based on the, the data and analytics that we pick up uh, uh, during operations. So technology is a, a key component to be able to assist in being able to do that. And why do we have to do this? Well, with the 15 million person trips uh, each day, uh, multiple uh, modes uh, working through the region, crossing multiple jurisdictions, uh, complicated by the congestion that, that we experience and daily crashes uh, that uh, make sure that every day is different and uh, being able to achieve uh, reliable operations is difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, just this slide is just to show an example of, of some of the technology foundation we have in terms of inventory out there. We have uh, uh, this, um, thousands of signals uh, connected to tens of uh, traffic signal systems. Uh, the transit system has uh, the ability to be able to track both the vehicles and the ridership within the vehicles. Uh, operators have access to uh, thousands, thousands of cameras. Uh, to be able to see what's happening in the network. So the document itself, uh, we developed visions and goals and objectives uh, stemming directly from the Regional Transportation Plan and, and Mobility Choice Blueprint, uh, which focused on technology in the region. Um, but build, uh, building a, uh, an operational concept uh, from that, uh, which is essentially just the roles and responsibilities and how the different uh, agencies and jurisdictions and, and uh, mobile operators will be working together. Uh, and that led to definition of regional initiatives, uh, which are gonna form the basis of our uh, scoring and uh, project selection for the uh, set aside that will be coming up here shortly. Uh, and I have a, a number there that we've, we've um, identified uh, 16, about 16 million uh, for that four year period uh, so far, but that, that number may increase. So the vision uh, is here, the goals there uh, in the, uh, uh, the document as well. The focus is on efficiency, safety, and reliability uh, to, to be able to provide that across the region. So also identify in, in the, the document are 10 objectives, uh, mostly focused on the improving the, 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 uh, the services that are provided to the travelers within the region. Uh, but we have our safety and admission uh, uh, objectives. Um, and we're also looking to improve the ability of the operators to uh, uh, operate the systems most effectively and allow the, the travelers to make the best uh, travel decisions that are going to meet their needs. Uh, the, in these uh, objectives here, what we want to make sure is that we have a, a good and reliable system uh, that isn't causing some of the uh, disruptions and delays that might be experienced by travelers. And then the last uh, three objectives there are the objectives that we are tracking for tra uh, um, safety and traffic incident management. And I'll just highlight the last one struck by incidents I saw on the news this morning that a, a CSP vehicle was struck on 470. So that number is going up. Uh, through the effort, uh, we did a physical uh, inventory of the uh, technology that's out there and also the services and, and compared that with the um, 
the uh, operational concept to see where we might have uh, gaps and uh, inform uh, our discussion on creating the initiatives to meet uh, uh, the operational concept that we define. So here you can see that this is a, a, a depiction of the arterial traffic cameras that are out there. You can see some very dense areas and other areas where they're a little less dense. So we have some uh, gaps to fill in terms of the, the data collection that's going on. Uh, this map is just showing, you know, kind of what we're dealing with. We have um, over 30 traffic signal systems in the region and uh, several of them are different manufacturers. So you can see with the different colors side by side to be able to uh, interconnect or uh, coordinate between systems uh, could be challenging. Uh, this graphic is showing, uh, you know, with, with the, uh, the, the goal of uh, interconnecting and coordinating operations and, and having cooperation and collaboration between the jurisdictions, uh, what we have to be able to do is uh, uh, be able to better share uh, data and uh, be able to act upon uh, that that uh, what that data is telling us. So we, we've defined three platforms uh, that to uh, be building to pr provide a foundation of that data sharing. Uh, the first one, situational awareness platform, is something that takes real-time data and allows operators and emergency staff to take action uh, in, in, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. The performance monitoring data archive platform uses the, the data that's being collected by all the systems and, and you are able to uh, analyze for trends and uh, make improvements over time. And then the multimodal regional travel information platform brings together access to all the different travel information sources uh, to make it easier for travelers to make their best mobility decisions. So from that, we created uh, several initiatives um, that are outlined in the document. They're grouped into three groups, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Uh, the primary group is the foundational uh, the set of initiatives that the others are going to build upon. So you can see here that the situational awareness platform and the performance measures data platform are, are um, identified in this group. Um, be, uh, deploying detection and being able to share cameras, not only between uh, jurisdictions, but between departments, uh, being uh, having uh, camera, camera control from the traffic management center to the computer aided dispatch uh, center uh, would, would be an example there. And then building from uh, the access to all that data, uh, we develop better strategies and processes to uh, collaboratively manage the operations, and that would be between jurisdictions and between modes. Uh, and, and here also included is the traffic incident management, which is the same. Uh, in the secondary and tertiary groups, um, the uh, we've identified evacuation planning, continuity of operations plans, uh, the stemming directly from our wildfires at the end of 2021. Uh, many of the other initiatives are focused on travel information, uh, being able to coordinate travel information between uh, jurisdictions and modes, and uh, you know even building the multimodal trip planner and payment system that RTD uh, uh, is taking lead for in the mobility choice blueprint. So to wrap up, uh, just uh, what the documents really focus on is that real-time data is essential to be able to operate, manage uh, a safe and reliable transportation system. Uh, on, on top of that, we need to be able to have collaborative and integrated management processes and approaches to be able to coordinate and collaborate together. Uh, we emphasize that technology is the tool and not the answer to be able to do these things. It's the processes of getting the, the different uh, transportation agencies working together is the key. Um, and that's where we identify the regional management might be needed for some of these key initiatives to be able to develop some of those platforms, for example, uh, would take le leadership at, at, at a higher level uh, and it may not be as effective at a local level uh, because this, your neighbors may not be able to um, meet the same uh, demands that, that uh, you, you've been able to in your jurisdiction. Uh, and then just finally ending off with the, the, the key role that, that Dr. Cogs has been playing in the, the traffic signal uh, 
to signal timing uh, across the region is something that we can continue to, to assist with, but will evolve uh, into monitoring some of the operations performance indicators that we uh, identified in, in the performance measures platform and be able to uh, continue to assist the uh, local agencies in making sure that the most optimum signal timing is in place. So that's my quick informational uh, summary. I'm available for any questions. You're muted, Mr. Chairman. I'm muted again. I'm sorry. Here I'm going, Director Harrison. Director Harrison, what's the matter? Sorry, Go ahead. sorry for it's not, it's not for you. It's all these me. questions today. Um, and great presentation here. The only quick question I have is in regard to we talk about all the the systems that we're talking about here. Um, how about the human element side of it? Do you feel that the operational staffing uh, that's required to maintain and support these operations, as diverse as they are? is up to task what are service level agreements that we have with vendors that are out there for all these disparate systems are they up to speed to handle uh, a growing um, population and more complexity that we have obviously we saw what happened with southwest and i apologize to anybody who had to fly southwest during that time i hope you were able to get to where you needed to but that happened in the private industry and just wanted to know on, on our side here are we able to scale? Do we have the right human element in the, in the staffing available for to handle those operational needs? Do we have any clarity on that? And also the systems themselves, are they very old? Are they, do they need to be upgraded? What kind of um, cost is associated with that? So um, any answers to that, Greg? Um, well, yeah, you're asking the right questions, uh, exactly. Um, uh, the staffing, to me, is is always been a concern uh, that we we put more responsibility uh, on the shoulders of the few people that are are doing that work. We're trying to help them by providing uh, good technology that they you know, that might be able to automate or just kind of you know broaden their reach. But th those those are issues, um, and and when you and and the, um, so it's something that we have to consider as we're deploying to make sure that we're not overreaching uh, when when we're deploying. Also, when you talk about the age of systems, that's uh, the interminable question because as soon as we get something deployed, it's already obsolete is what it yep. feels like. Uh, and then when you see the numbers that we're talking about across the region, it takes time and money to uh, be able to switch systems out to update them. So you know, we we have to do our best. And, and so it, again, it is a very important consideration as, as we move forward in terms of defining these projects and, and of course in the project selection process. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Mulvey. Hi, yes, I have one very quick question and I think I know the answer, but would like some clarification. It might be directed to others on the staff. Is, uh, would this plan at all have any effect on funding that would go towards to in the TIP process or scoring of projects? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, put differently, perhaps, would it become a part of the scoring process for projects when they're submitted to the TIP or even a set aside? Ah, uh, yes. So um, the, this is focused on the uh, regional transportation operations and technology set aside uh, in the TIP. And so uh, it, it's focused exclusively on that. Uh, it, it, I think it is uh, good to consider uh, elements uh, for future TIP projects that uh, might fall into the technology area. But we've, uh, it's been tradition for some time here, Dr. Cog, to have uh, the technology as a separate, uh, the, um, uh, I don't wanna say the word pool, but pool uh, that, that we work with in, in uh, identifying those technology projects. Thank you. Thank you. Doug, did you wanna 
add to that or are you okay? All right, uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, and I will be quick. Um, I just wanted to share, so one of our staff who serves on the on the transportation of the, the TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee, um, he had sent some suggestions for reorganizing the, um, the objectives in the RTO. I'm not gonna go through them now because it's late, but could I, Greg, send that to you um, just as some input? I think you indicated we were going to have a more extensive discussion about this at a future meeting. Um, could I just send send that to you and, and just for your consideration? Yes, please. Okay, thanks. I'll do that. Great. All right. Any other questions for Greg? Seeing none, I really appreciate it, Greg. Thank you very much for, for uh, being here and giving this presentation to us. Thank you. We'll move on now to uh, our informational items. We have three specifically that have a that are in the packet: the annual listing of obligated projects, or ALOP, uh, administrative modifications to the 2225 TIP, and the draft 2023 policy statement on federal legislative issues. Please uh, hold on to your packet and read them at your convenience if you haven't done so already. Uh, next up is committee reports, and I want to uh, take this moment to uh, go over to the addendum to our agenda and ask uh, uh, Director Dyack uh, from the nominating committee to give a report uh, to us on the nominating committee results. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Director Dyack. I, I appreciate the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, nominating committee um, uh, comprised of uh, Director Mulvey, Director Williams, Director Hausman, uh, Director Stolzman, myself, and Director Sangren uh, met to consider all the applications for the um, Executive uh, Committee. Uh, it was um, very tough, uh, great conversation. We appreciate everyone who expressed an interest. I personally talked to each of them, both those who were, who were uh, chosen to be recommended and those who were not, and uh, all understood and um, all indicated that they would like to uh, continue to uh, um, be a part of the Dr. Cog family and uh, get more involved. But uh, the nominating committee uh, selected for vice chair, Director Shaw, uh, for secretary, Director Baker. Uh, those two are traditional move ups. And uh, for the treasurer slot, uh, we selected uh, Director uh, Whitlow. She is uh, Mayor Whitlow uh, from the town of Meade. And uh, that will the, that is the slate that the nominating committee is presenting to the board for consideration. Uh, we will elect the officers at the February meeting. And um, if anybody is interested, you can also um, identify yourself at the floor. But uh, the slate is as presented. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Dyack, uh, for that report. Let me go back to my agenda. Too many screens open here. A report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Director Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The stack did not meet in January. Look forward to meeting in February. Okay. Uh, great report. Uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus, uh, Director Starker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. The uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus met in a retreat last uh, Saturday. We reviewed our 2020 uh, work that we did. We look forward to 2023. We uh, reaffirmed our recommitment to regionalism and send our best wishes to the Dr. Cog board for the new year. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The last meeting we had was our December 15th Joint MAC and uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus holiday event at the Grant Humphreys Mansion. Uh, we're currently working on the transition from Arapaho County, taking the lead at Amac to Boulder County and setting up the 2023 meetings. We have not set those yet, and I will report next month on when those have been set up. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the Advisory Committee on Aging did not meet, so the, it, there is no report from uh, Jayla Sanchez-Warren. Uh, report from the Regional Air Quality Council, uh, Rec Executive Director Rex. Mr. Chairman, the RAC did not meet since our last meeting either. Okay, thank you. I almost called you uh, Executive Director. <laughs> I haven't Rex. called worse than that today. <laughs> uh, Director uh, Mulvey, uh, E-470 Authority. Oh, train on mute there. Thank you. 
Um, thanks to uh, Director Dyack for covering me at the last meeting. We have not met since. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, this is great. Uh, Director uh, White, a report from CDOT. Uh, thank you, Chair. I passed through these tonight. Um, a, a few things to report on the CDOT end, um, partly because I was unable to join the meeting in December and did want to, to note for the board, we had a pretty momentous uh, uh, ribbon cutting for a project that many of you know, uh, the Central 70 project, uh, the ribbon was cut for that in late November, uh, which we're pleased to have the governor out um, and a lot of elected officials uh, from around the area, um, sort of noting that accomplishment. And I, I just want to acknowledge that Dr. Cog has sort of been a partner um, in that project. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my early uh, experiences with the Dr. Cog board was, was seeking support for that project. So it's really nice to see that wrap up. Uh, and to that end, the, the sort of next step for that project is to uh, operationalize the tolling along the express lane. Um, and one element I wanna note there that's really unique for CDOT and really for Colorado is we've developed a tolling equity program to go along with that, which will uh, give the residents of the Global Illyria Swansea neighborhood access to uh, $100 for a, a toll pass as well as transit passes, um, which is really meant to sort of recognize that uh, that neighborhood uh, bared the brunt of the of that project and its construction and we want to make sure that they have full access uh, to those lanes when they open so really uh, glad to see that development uh, we'll see the the tolls uh, begin in late february a uh, couple other things on the grants front we are always um, seem to be with the passage of the bil in sort of a grants phase but we're now looking at the next round um, for what cdot will apply um, and looking at um, resubmitting for the six and Wadsworth project, which we've submitted for before. Um, been a project that's been on the books for a long time and was uh, recognized as a project of merit with our last submissions. We feel pretty good that our chances for that might be good in this next round. Um, and also uh, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, Boulder County on 119 and the, the continuing work there to make that a, a BRT corridor. The last piece I'll mention is, is just a word on snow. Uh, while we didn't see quite the storm in Denver, we are really getting hammered around the state. Um, and next time uh, you see a plow driver out there, please give them a friendly wave. There's 52 inches of snow on Wolf Creek Pass right now. And How we much? have got 52 inches. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and we've had some of our, our snow fighter crews pretty much on continuous snow shifts since Sunday around the state. So um, I really admire uh, those professionals um, at CDOT and, and of all the public works departments around the state. They do an incredible job to keep us all safe. Uh, and, and lastly, this um, as will be my uh, last uh, Dr. Cog update for CDOT as I am, am moving on to new adventures, but I, I just wanna say thank you to the board the partnership that we have with Dr. Cog is is incredible, and I've learned a tremendous amount from my time on this group. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director White. Let me add uh, my thanks to you for all the the uh, involvement, the work you've done, and the, just a really professional uh, representation you've brought on behalf of CDOT to Dr. Cog. And uh, I wish you well. I can't speak for all the board members, but I hope I do. Uh, wish you well in whatever it is you are choosing to do next. And so thank you very much. We'll give a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, next up is a report from RTD and uh, Director Welch, Brian Welch. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Just two, one thing to report on two upcoming meetings, January 31st, 3 p.m. in Boulder will be the first of two Northwest Rail peak hour feasibility study public meetings. The second will be in Westminster, February 2nd at three o'clock PM. That's my report. Thank you, I uh, appreciate it. Uh, administrative items, our next meeting is February 15, uh, Wednesday, February 15. Uh, other matters by members, is there any director who has an item that, uh, that they wish to present to the colleagues here? Raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, I wish everybody uh, 
a safe and uh, rest of your week. Uh, I'm glad that uh, we met virtually, although it wasn't as bad a storm as, uh, as we could have had. Uh, but uh, thank you all for being here and making that quick adjustment. And with that, uh, seeing no further hands raised, we will be adjourned at uh, 8.54. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, night. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Good night.